Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If this is your very first time here, and you're somebody who enjoys listening to scary stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. Here in this channel, I upload every single night. Also, before we get started, please leave a like on today's video. Thank you, let's begin. Wow, where do I even begin? Today marked the commencement of a new chapter in my life. It feels a bit overwhelming, akin to tossing a stone into a small pond. The ripples of change were all around me. I suppose the best way to start is with my new living situation. After countless hours of scrolling through rental listings, an 800 square foot, two-bedroom apartment emerged like a beacon of hope. A nondescript building at the edge of town, it looked pretty faded and the walls looked yellow. It was pretty dubious, the carpet something from a bygone era. Yet at just $900 a month, including utilities, thank god, it was the perfect option for my budget and the stepping stone I desperately needed. I now find myself at the generous age of 28, juggling a job at an IT support company in town. My days are spent immersed in a sea of screens, troubleshooting software issues for clients both near and far. While I enjoy the technical challenges and the satisfaction that comes from resolving critical problems, I'll admit that my day-to-day -day life can feel a bit monotonous. I found somewhat of a respite in the miniature and a reboot, a reboot here, a system update there. But there's a thrill in the chaos of tech support. The unpredictable nature of each call feels like a wild card, often leading to an unexpected encounter that brings a bit of spice and drama to my work life. Of course, the real reason I took this plunge into the world of renting, rented living, is to gain my independence. While I had my family and a tight-knit group of friends, living alone was a dream I held onto longer than I care to admit. This apartment, the idea of crafting it into a home with my unique touches and quirks, was all I could think about. The idea of stretching those wings and personalizing my little haven however imperfect, did make me excited. I surveyed my new sanctuary. The wide open spaces of my two-room dwelling beckoned me to create. The smaller room, though imperfect, radiated potential. I decided on a workspace for my side hustle. I was a freelancer, and I could channel my creativity into good visual escapades for clients. With a sagging IKEA desk barely clinging to its pinned together form and my cherished ergonomic chair, I settled down along the stacks of periwinkle, sea green, and warm sand coloured stationery. The colours of my workspace ignited a sense of purpose. A few days before the move, I got wind of my new roommate Sasha, a pretty weird and OCD style girl. It wasn't a great household dynamic, having people right by you, but it was part of the new journey. It was essential, especially for the price I was paying. I felt that I needed someone to share occasional meals and chats with late into the night. I'm a person that gets lonely pretty easily, and FaceTime just doesn't cut it. I was assured by our mutual friend that Sasha was a chill person, easygoing, quiet, and perfect for living together. Little did I know that our mutual friend might have overlooked some critical details. The first night we met, Sasha seemed normal enough. She had shaggy hair and wore a large hoodie that seemed perpetually overstuffed, hinting at a lack of regard for skirt style or hygiene. Our initial interactions were standard small talk, the boring rhythm of discovering quirks, hobbies, and routines. I learned that she worked at a local bookstore, 
going around and just sorting out books. <laughs> Sounds fun, right? We both shared interests in sci-fi films, though I must confess, I was one to enjoy a good thriller now and then, whereas Sasha's preference leaned more towards literary fiction and even poetry, which kind of caught me off of guard a little bit. Fast forward a few weeks and I began to notice some quirks that hinted at deeper shadows in Sasha's nature. She had often linger by my door. I'd be able to see from the shadow underneath the crack the difference between the floor and the door is a couple of inches maybe. I don't know. The person that fitted this door clearly had no idea what they were doing. Sasha seemed to be listening closely when I'd be engaged in conversation with friends over the phone. At first, I just thought, she's being nosy, a social slip that sometimes accompanies introverted lifestyles. Over time, however, her behavior transformed from curious to very uncomfortable. At random times, she had asked me eerie questions about my routines and preferences, almost as if cataloging the minutes of my life. I've been known to overthink situations, and surely it was only my imagination running wild, but I didn't like the feeling I had with Sasha. I'd always despised people who invaded others' privacy, and now sharing a living space with one felt like a punishment. A mild claustrophobia began to creep in, a gradual accumulation, on a quiet Thursday night, a restless energy settled over our apartment. I no longer felt at ease with Sasha, but rather extremely uncomfortable. I had just finished binge-watching a new thriller series, and I was preparing for bed. I plastered the room with my favourite posters, an organic art piece of northern lights against a vivid mountainous backdrop hung above my bed. I tucked into bed resolving to text my best friend Lauren in the morning for that much-needed coffee catch-up, when, all at once, I heard a banging sound by my bedroom door. At first, I thought it was just the creaky old building settling, or maybe my anxious mind was just conjuring up sounds out of nowhere, but the noise escalated, shifting into a deliberate rattle, a persistent tapping against the door. I could feel the adrenaline in my body, and my instincts began to kick in. Was it Sasha? Was someone breaking into the house? I couldn't understand. Hello? I called out, trying to make my voice sound steady. There was just silence. Another thud resonated, this one more defined, almost purposeful. I maneuvered myself towards the door peering through the tiny peephole. A risky move, perhaps, but I had to know who was on the other side. I squinted through the tiny lens and was met with a shadow of a figure standing still, almost as though she was waiting for me to make the next move. My blood ran cold. Suddenly it hit me. The figure was unmistakably Sasha. My gut twisted. The default thought waged war against my defensive instincts. Was she trying to prank me, or was there something different happening here? Did she want me to open the door? Was she knocking? It didn't sound like a knock. I had to act. This was not normal. With every ounce of strength, I turned the lock and flung open the door, a wild thrust of the handle in the face of my terror. Sasha stood at the ready eyes directly on mine. What are you doing? Her tone came out of nowhere. Can you step back? I said. I had never been close to feeling genuinely afraid for my safety. But instead of retreating, she took a step forward. Come on, don't be so dramatic. You can't just lock yourself away all the time. It's lonely in here. There are boundaries, Sasha. You don't just come to my door uninvited. Leave now. As I pushed back the doorframe, instincts took over. In an act of sheer desperation, I shoved her away, 
my hand swiftly connected with her shoulders. To my horror, Sasha stumbled back but regained her balance almost immediately as a cocky smirk returned to her face. Is this how you treat someone who cares, is it? She taunted, stepping forward once again. But her movements were slower, as if she was savoring everything she was doing. I grabbed the nearest thing, a random lamp on the bedside table, sufficed with the weight of purpose, and swung it directly towards her head. The base slammed into her arm, missing her head entirely, and the next thing I know, she's run to the kitchen to get kitchen knives. This is when things got a little out of control. I made my way to the exit, unlocked the door in a matter of seconds, and ran down to the ground floor in the fire exit, not even bothering to wait for the lift. I don't know if Sasha was going to kill me that night, and I had no idea what her intentions were stood outside my door, but I think it's clear to say that I won't be living with her ever again. I filed to cancel my agreement for the tenancy. I had to lose a whole month's salary, i.e. $900, because the tenant slash landlord agreement said that I had to give at least two weeks notice. Wow, great, right? Even if you're threatened with knives, you still have to lose bunches of money. I went through the court systems, and although the landlord didn't get awarded anything, and nor did I, it was found that Sasha was actually guilty of trying to harm me. It was an attempted murder, but I can't remember the exact phrasing, attempted harm or bodily something. I'm still alive and that's all that matters. I now live in a different apartment. My housemate isn't a psycho that wields knives, thank god. Well, here I am, sitting in my new home, or at least what I thought would be a home. I can't really believe that it's just been two weeks. I was the proud owner of a little property around Louisiana Way. It cost me around $500,000. While that number echoed in my mind like a triumphant achievement or accomplishment, I didn't realize that I was merely buying my ticket to a very difficult reality. It all felt too perfect, too good, as I stood in front of my new house. An old place, but it had character, a welcoming porch, and all. The old magnolia tree in the front, and the flowers down the left and right hand side, making me feel alive and hopeful. Yes, it needed renovation, but I saw potential. I pictured myself sipping sweet tea while rocking away on the porch, watching the world go by. I'll admit it, I had stars in my eyes. Oh, how naive I was. I initially planned a comprehensive makeover starting with subtle aesthetics and gradually making essential repairs. I had some DIY experience and watched more than enough home improvement shows to make me feel like an expert. I was going to document the entire journey, painting walls, replacing floors and even updating plumbing. The thought filled me with excitement and energy. I imagined inviting friends over to show off my handiwork relishing their admiration for my creativity and effort. I even envisioned the many housewarming parties that I would throw, the laughter and the joy that could take place within these walls. Ah, what a dreamer I was. But as each day slipped by, so too did my hopes and my dreams. The moment I stepped through the front door, 
I was met with the odour of dampness and mildew. How had I missed that during the walkthrough? Perhaps I was too entranced by vision boards and Pinterest ideas. The wallpaper peeling off the walls seemed to laugh at my optimism, and the cracked tiles on the floor looked like they were settling in for an eternal battle against wear and tear. Immediately, reality set in. I began to wonder if I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. I asked for help from friends and family. You've got this, it's just a bit of elbow grease, they cheered, encouraged by their hollow support. I rolled up my sleeves and started work. I remember the first task, peeling away the horrendous floral motifs that had adorned the living room walls for decades. The previous owners had surely favoured those patterns during a forgotten era, and as we stripped the layers away, we discovered, surprise, more layers beneath. Decades of accumulated design disasters slowly revealed. Maybe it's a good sign, I thought, half-heartedly laughing. This house has character. My friends rolled their eyes, but we kept going, fueled by camaraderie and the nostalgia of youth. Those carefree days when all that mattered was hard work and laughter. But it didn't take long for the levity of the situation to start plummeting like the temperature in those early November evenings. The deeper we dug into this renovation, the more faults revealed themselves. The kitchen, it turned out to be a cesspool of broken cupboards and warped countertops. The plumbing issues were so severe that I wouldn't have even been able to find a ghost of a plumber wandering the halls, shaking his head at the abysmal state of affairs. The minute I tried to replace a leaky facet, the entire supply line ruptured, unleashing a miniature flood that soaked my socks and sent me skittering across the floor like a cartoon character. Each day was a grind. My friends began to lose their enthusiasm as the house continually mocked our efforts. What's your plan for the bathroom? One of them asked, while I stared at the cracked linoleum floors. I had no plan, not any good ones anyway. I just wanted something, anything, to go right for once. Storm clouds were brewing over Louisiana. I felt an urgent need to tackle the living room. I figured ripping up that outdated carpet would unveil hardwood floors that deep down were just a waiting game. They could still be made nice, maybe I could just have all wooden flooring in here. I could envision the light gleaming off the polished wood floor, but instead what lay beneath was worse than I could ever have imagined. Warped boards, cracks and an unsettlingly foul odour. It felt as if the house was conspiring against me. Every tackle turned into a trip to the local hardware store, where I would spend more hours and dollars than I would hoped for looking for materials to patch up the growing list of issues. Each failed attempt reminded me that I was sinking deeper into a money pit I never asked to dive into. I could almost hear my bank account sobbing. Yet, I forged ahead, perhaps driven by my stubbornness more than practicality. Rolling enough paint to create a peaceful haven in my mind became the order of business. But then came the fateful day when I was on a particular ambitious ladder, determined to replace a section of the ceiling that had quite literally fallen apart. The moment the world above me seemed to shudder, I felt a life-altering tremor beneath my feet. I can still remember that split second of clarity as I instinctively reached out for balance, only for the universe to conspire against me one final time. The ceiling broke loose. In that terrifying moment, everything slowed down. I watched in terror as the beams of wood broke free, sending splinters flying like deadly confetti. The heavy structure came crashing down, 
right on top of me. My last thoughts were a prayer, a prayer that I had at least chosen the right curtains. When I woke up, I was greeted by soft sounds and weird, f weird colours of white. Panic gripped me as I tried to move, only to be met with a suffocating pain shooting down my spine. It was a dull throb that felt as if it was singing a morning song for everything I once was. I attempted to muster the courage to sit up, but my body betrayed me in a way that only had bad dreams. That was when I noticed it. The unforgiving truth. I was confined to a wheelchair. In that moment, a flood of emotions crashed over me. Fear, denial, anger. But the most overwhelming feeling was the crushing weight of loss. I was not just losing the ability to walk. I was losing a part of my life that I had envisioned so clearly. My dreams of entertaining friends and family in my freshly renovated home were now replaced with the stark reality of a broken back and a shattered spirit. The next few weeks were hell. I spent my days in the hospital surrounded by doctors, nurses, and the dreaded physical therapists. Their gentle encouragement only grated against the bitter reality I face. You are strong, you can do this, they said. But all I could think of was my home, the crumbling place that I'd promised so much and given so little. It took everything I had to adjust to this new way of living. I looked out the window of my hospital room and I thought of how the Louisiana sky cradled morning light. Was this truly my life now? Everything I'd done had filtered down to this one moment. After weeks of therapy, I reluctantly made my way back to the house. Now swathed with bandages and memories of better days, my wheelchair rolled across the threshold, and in an instant, it was as if time paused. The house, though still a disarray, seemed to breathe alongside me, wrapping its arms around my broken spirit. There was a certain eeriness in how it welcomed me back, and it was extremely creepy. After the accident, I was permanently paralysed from the waist down, which means here we are, I'm stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Since the accident, my family and my friends have been a lot more supportive. That is so nice of them, and in actual fact, my friends are the reason I managed to fix this house and safely redo the roof with the help of professional roofers. It did cost a whole bunch more money, but we did a crowdfunder and a lot of people donated from my close family, my distance family and mutual friends of relatives and of course other friends. It was hard work and paying for the professionals to do the roof was the most expensive and tiresome part, the part that resulted in me being bound to a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I was not expecting this to happen and I suppose I'll let this be a warning to some of you trying to do all your own housework yourself. Sure, do the flooring, sure, do the decorating and put the furniture in, even do the plumbing if you know what you're doing. But please, by God, leave the structural stuff to the professionals. If you start playing with walls, beams or support brackets, you're going to end up in a very sticky situation. Let my story be a warning. It's worth paying for the professionals, rather than staying in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. If you're reading this, 
know that I'm not sure what I'll do with this once I'm done writing. Perhaps I'll bury it in the garden as a tale of warning, or perhaps I'll burn it in a fire, letting the flames consume this whole laptop as this property has consumed my peace. Life at Barnwood Farm was supposed to be a fresh start. I first stood in this small plot of land surrounded by wide open fields and clusters of trees a few weeks ago. A backdrop painted in the colours of solitude. But now, now I don't even want to fall asleep here. It's hard to recount what's happened over the past few weeks. The memories are still fresh, but... It's terrifying. I moved here around about three weeks ago, or two and a half, away from the city where I used to live. I was seeking some peace and quiet after being made redundant and kicked out of my job that I had been in for over five years. So much for employee respect and rights, eh? Barnwood Farm had that rustic charm I always dreamed of. There were a couple of properties dotted about this area, one of which was way too expensive and completely out of my budget. The one I'd picked was weathered by time, but I felt like I could definitely do it up. There was a farmhouse, an outbuilding, a barn, and this garage type shed thing. Welcome home, I heard whispers as I walked into the property. My two dogs, Jasper and Astrid, golden retrievers with hearts as vast as the fields around us, chased around butterflies by day and settled beside the fire by night. But then, the night shifted. It began subtly, a sound of a child crying out. I would stand by the window, peering into the black night, half expecting to see a new life emerging from the shadows, but instead I'd see nothing, just darkness. It didn't take long before the wildlife began to reveal itself. This place was way worse than I'd thought. I'd catch glimpses of something in the edge of the property, just between the woods and where my field started. It had red fur, and was what I assumed to be a fox. They were beautiful creatures in my opinion. It's true, but those vivid pupils did not shine with mischief. They looked twisted. Days later, and I still continued to see way too many foxes for my liking. I didn't know if I had something they wanted, or if there was some kind of a carcass scattered about the property. At first, they kept their distance, stalking and watching silently across the property, they were mere shadows skirting the edges of the light cast by the porch lamp. I kept my doors locked at night, feeling ridiculous from my growing paranoia from a bunch of foxes. Yeah, because they're going to come up to the porch, go on their hind legs and open the door, aren't they? Well, something happened, and I'll never forget it. I was sat in my living room, wrapped around a couple blankets, watching the fireplace. Jasper and Asher were laying at my feet. Their steadfast presence was offering me comfort. But as the clock struck two, there was a commotion outside. First, I start hearing a bunch of growling and yipping. Then there was a screaming noise, but it didn't sound human. Not animal either. Something in between an unnatural turmoil that pierced through the peace of me and my dog's evening. Before I could react, Astra jumped up, her instincts driving her into action. Jasper, protective and brave, followed closely. I threw the blankets off my body and ran to the nearest window, wondering what on earth was going on outside. The pack emerged, a wave of red fur swarming across the farm. There must have been at least seven of them. The foxes were, well, maybe even more than seven. I can't fully remember. Probably more like a dozen. They were all congregated beneath the trees. 
Their movements were not normal. Their movements were erratic, as if they were possessed by something, something more than mere hunger. I yelled for my dogs and started panicking as they both went outside to chase after the foxes. It's a totally natural thing to do, and every time the foxes will of course run away. Astro and Jasper will never catch them as they're way too fast, but before Astro and Jasper even chase them, I knew just by looking at the foxes that their behaviour was not right. Come back! Get inside! But Astro and Jasper were caught in the riptide of their instincts. Before I knew it, they were already racing towards the chaos, overwhelmed by the primal urge to protect, defend, and also play. What followed happened so quickly that I could barely process a thing. I rushed straight to the door with adrenaline fueling my every step, but when I threw it open, it was too late. The foxes had began attacking Astra and Jasper. The scene that played out tore my heart into a million pieces. The yelps and the howls mingled with an otherworldly growl from the creatures that overwhelmed the yard. The sight was terrifying. Astra and Jasper don't know how to fight. They don't know as their lovely animals. Their lovers, carers, and their kind. These foxes were not normal. They were predators, raw, merciless, and disgusting. Without even thinking, I ran towards them with no thought of preserving myself, just instincts set in to save my two babies. My only goal was to save them. But, as I reached the threshold of my yard, I heard another scream rip through the air raising the hair on my arms. Astro and Jasper were caught in the wild dance of death, pleading for their lives while scrummaging around on the floor, being eaten and bitten in multiple locations. I would never forget the way that Astra's sweet eyes flickered in the desperate for help. The memory of that night lingers like a ghost and the taste of despair still thick on my tongue. I blinked back screaming for them until my voice cracked, but it didn't matter. The foxes, they were gone, vanished into the dark, leaving behind chaos and lifeless bodies. From that moment, the nights at Barnwood Farm changed from loving and peaceful to unbearable. I grieved in solitude, their absence was echoed through the farmhouse. Each night turned into a bunch of fear as the clock struck two, knowing this was how I lost my babies. Fear would spread its fingers around my throat, squeezing tighter with every howl that erupted from the woods surrounding my farm. I barricaded my bedroom door, imagining it would keep the nightmare at bay. But it was all in vain. Each rustling branch, every murmur of the wind, eventually sleep eluded me, transforming my once peaceful place into a prison. I knew I couldn't stay, I had to leave this cursed land. It wasn't normal for foxes to do this, but clearly they thought that Asher and Jasper were a threat, and the ten or so of them turned on both my dogs, both of which who are not fighters, and have never bitten anyone or anything other than a toy in their entire lives. The vet couldn't make it in time. He wasn't even awake. It took him a whole fifty minutes just to make it. I couldn't stop the bleeding. My dreams of the life in the countryside now were no longer. I started browsing property listings, imagining myself elsewhere, detached from this horror, Yet with every listing, a sense of defeat washed over me. Who would want a farm marred by tragedy? The second attack, if I could even call it that, happened exactly a week later. I thought the foxes would stay away after such a display of violence, but as soon as it got dark, they were back. The same horrifying scenario played out, 
but this time, with more predictability, it was as if they had formed a schedule. They turned up during mostly full moons. I huddled in my room, trembling, knowing that Astra and Jasper wouldn't be there to rush to the door. There was no one left but me and my insomnia. I began to research rabies, an obsession that stemmed from panic wondering what made the foxes turn on my two dogs. The symptoms of these diseases were in my mind. Agitation, confusion, hallucinations. Was it even conceivable that these creatures were rabid? They did tests on Astra and Jasper, and nothing came up. I learned that it could take weeks for rabies symptoms to appear. What if these foxes were merely carriers, waiting for the right moment to strike. Night after night, I watched their hollowed gatherings through my window. The way they ghosted through the fields with their heads bobbing made me feel sick, and at times, although I hate to admit this, I wanted to go out and shoot every single one of them for what they did to my two babies. Putting the farm up for sale was extremely difficult, I've now sold it, and since, someone's renamed the farm, I explained to them everything that happened, and, although it was difficult, and at first I thought I'd turn them away, in the long run they seemed to change their mind, merely because the price was so good that they just couldn't deny it. I don't know what I'm going to do anymore, but I know that if I ever get a country property again in rural lands, I'll 100% get fences gates and property lines, although that probably won't do much to stop them, as my auntie and uncle once had a fox jump over a ten-foot fence to kill all of their hens and chickens. I never thought I'd find myself looking for the warmth of city lights, busy streets, and constant noise. But right now, as I sit in the old wooden chair that creaks under the weight of its own history, I realise just how comforting the familiar chaos of urban life can actually be. What should have been a thrilling venture into the idyllic countryside has turned into a pretty frightening experience. It's a story, a story full of the shadows of an old country house, and as bizarre as it may sound, I believe that I must document every detail before I forget, or worse, let it haunt me permanently. Three months ago, I first laid eyes on the house, up until then, life had become a redundant routine of skyscraper views and work deadlines. I was looking forward to a retreat, a sanctuary away from the urban life. After weeks of searching online, I found an advertisement that sparked my imagination. I found a Victorian era house with creeping ivy an intricate woodwork that seemed to whisper stories. Though the pictures were alluring, they were far from the captivating aura that greeted me in person. There was something enchanting about stepping inside that house for the first time. The air was stale, as if it had been waiting years to be stirred by some open windows. The sunlight streamed through the dusty windows, you could see the beauty that this place once held, the large oak stairwell, and the tiling in the grand entry entryway. But it was accompanied by a pretty eerie feeling, a silent warning lingering in the air. 
I chose to ignore the chill that crept up my spine, telling myself it was just a draft and that I would soon call this place home. Even as I signed the paperwork, little alarm bells rang in the back of my mind, red flags flashing with intensity. The real estate agent, a woman named Majori, with an unnerving smile and an inexplicable knowledge of the house's history, had brushed off my recent questions about the property's past with a vague sort of shrug. Oh, <laughs> Every house has its quirks, she would say, her eyes moving about the room to the deep shadows of the hallway. But this one is particularly special. Who doesn't enjoy a mystery, right? The first few weeks were overwhelmingly blurred. All the boundaries of work and home were intertwined. I was filled in with renovations and packing 24-7. I desperately pulled together my vision of the idyllic country house. But, amidst the renovations, I often found myself feeling a heaviness settle over me, an uneasiness that spiralled into nightmares filled with echoes and whispers. Perhaps it was just my imagination, fueled by late nights of painting and construction, Stress removing had a way of weaving itself into my subconscious and wreaking havoc on my well-being. Then came the night that changed everything. It was a particularly cold evening, the wind was blowing around 15 miles per hour outside. I had finally finished painting my bedroom and was thrilled with the transformation. I had just began to settle in when I heard it for the first time a low, murmuring sound coming from out the hall. Okay, so what's this? I thought that maybe this was something like a natural settling noise that all old homes would have, perhaps they're notorious for this. The days passed and I carried on with my work, forgetting about this noise that I heard, I noticed the sound only seemed to increase as the night went on. I heard it again, then I remembered. The next night, I heard it again. I remembered standing in the kitchen one evening, chopping some vegetables for dinner. I can't remember what I was making, but I do remember that I was chopping carrots. I was immersed in the rhythmicness of chopping with my knife against the board, and there it was again, the murmur echoed out, but this time it sounded further up the hallway, way closer to the kitchen where I was stood, almost as if someone was stood just beyond the walls. I grasped the counter tightly, I started getting scared and wondering what this noise actually was. I would always been drawn to ghost stories, but experiencing one was another thing entirely. I'd never anticipated how terrifying it would actually be. That night, after quickly scoffing down dinner, I ran off to my bedroom, leaving the lights on in the whole house, including the living room. Hours passed, and just as my eyelids grew heavy, I was jolted awake by the unmistakable sound of heavy breathing right next to me. I turned my head slowly only to discover my new bedroom bathed in moonlight. The air shifted. I had forgotten to shut my window, my curtain was wide open, and I'd been so anxious and stressed all day that I'd just forgotten. I had to reassure myself that I was alone, and I willed myself to ignore the small voice urging me otherwise. I got out of bed, shut the window, and pulled the curtains across. The next day, after a restless night, I gathered courage. I decided to confront the peculiar sounds head on. I rummaged through the boxes I had yet to unpack, searching for the few books I owned on the history of the town. 
I settled in the parlour, immersing myself in the fragmented records of families who had called this majestic house their home, for be it five years, fifty years, or even five hundred years, just a different structure on the same land. There were tales of love affairs, chilling betrayals, and one particularly chilling story of a family that had vanished under mysterious circumstances decades ago. As the shadows lengthened and melded into darkness around me, I recalled Marjorie's unsettling smile when I'd inquired about the house's history. Had she known what had happened? Had she known something that I didn't? I felt a knot tighten in my stomach as I think of the whispers, now echoing in my memory, the resemblance to the haunting story I'd just read was significant. The pages were talking about a bunch of information detailing a young girl named Eliza who vanished without a trace, leaving her family to scour the countryside in search for their lost child. That night, something compelled me to investigate further. I gathered a flashlight, my heart racing as every creak of the floorboards echoed louder than the last. I moved through the house, each room filled with remnants of its former glory and layers of forgotten lives. I stopped in front of a particularly worn door at the end of the hallway, the attic. The door stood slightly ajar the dark space beyond shrouded in uncertainty. Perhaps this was where the echoes originated, my lungs constricted in hesitation, but I had to go down. After a few moments after controlling myself, I stepped inside. With the flick of my flashlight, the beam illuminated dust mites dancing in the air, revealing an entirely different world underground. Old furniture laid discarded beneath white sheets, and remnants of time past were scattered about. Broken dolls, old books, and family portraits with their faces scratched out. Each step I took felt like an intrusion on a forbidden secret. This was more than enough for me to learn about. In fact, discovering all of this was nothing short of terrifying, and above all, I didn't want to be dead in this place. I felt like there were many ghosts, not just one, and I'd heard stories of people being killed or even having heart attacks as the result of spirits. Now while some of you may think I'm crazy or insane, the things I saw and heard made me think otherwise. I sold the house, I jumped into the deep end and said screw it, this was something I wasn't willing to do, and I definitely didn't like the idea of living with ghosts, no matter how peaceful they may be. My family laughed at me, I lost over $80,000 in the price difference between buying and selling, but I don't think they'd be laughing if I wound up sleep deprived or dead in my bed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying tuned until the end of tonight's stories. Please, 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 if you're new to my channel, consider subscribing, and also, please, 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 drop a like on today's video, every single one of you, and leave a comment. It really helps when you comment on the videos, because it tells YouTube that you want to interact with my content, because you find it engaging, interesting, and um, original. Here on this channel, I add my voiceover 
to all stories. I don't use AI voices. I don't um, cut corners. I don't uh, take people's stories off Reddit like a lot of the other horror story channels do without asking their permission. In fact, I work very hard on this channel. Obviously, I don't mean to blow my own trumpet and get you know, have a rant here, but I really, really, really appreciate it. All of you that comment and like the videos. It helps my channel grow. It helps me put effort into this channel. And um, since I stopped uh, having my wife help me on this channel, it's been a more workload that I've taken on. However, I want to please you guys. I want to make you happy. And I have so many comments every day of people saying that this is the best horror story channel on YouTube. And that, that literally melts my heart right now. I want to I wanna swear, but I want to be passionate about this, but, you know, I get in trouble by YouTube if I do. So, it genuinely freaking melts my heart when people say that, um, because I work so hard on this channel. Uh, there's, there's preparation, planning, imaging, uh, voiceover, editing, uploading, titles, description, thumbnail emails. I get all these stupid companies trying to advertise with me and... And then trying to do brand deals and offers. And, and I say, look, I don't want to advertise, uh, you know, some silly product that has nothing to do with horror stories. Um, it just, you know, I'm not here to beg for donations, have Patreon or Patreon. I'm not here to sell you silly mugs with my image of my merch on or whatever. I am just here to be a storyteller, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons people like me so much. Um. Since I've been so authentic and uh, I upload every single day, I get better views. I get good views. And since my wife has now stopped and I can pronounce the words that she can't and people prefer my voice, even the people that liked my wife, they prefer my voice um, and they admit that. So this is the reason why my channel is now going to start growing again and the videos are doing a lot better than they used to. So I really, really thank every single one of you. I will continue to work very hard on this channel uh and uh all i asked is that you comment like well that's all you can do if you're already subscribed is just like and comment however if you're not subscribed and this is the type of thing you'd be interested in then you can hit the sub and uh, hopefully hopefully youtube might or might not rec uh tell you when i've uploaded it depends there's been a bit of a scandal about that where people subscribe but they weren't shown the videos of the channel they subscribe to so youtube made a silly thing where you have to now click the bell next to the subscribe button so basically you have to subscribe twice and a lot of you if you're still watching right now just pop down below and check next to the red subscribe button it'll say you're subscribed however there should be a gray bell next to that if that gray bell isn't like if it doesn't have lines either side of it as if it's ringing then it means you haven't got it's called notifications turned on I know it's so confusing i'm sorry if you're a boomer and you're watching this they're just trying to make it so confusing for the older souls <laughs> um but yeah technically you're not fully subscribed if you haven't clicked that bell so you won't get told when i upload so this is why you might be missing my videos this is why you might be not getting recommended my videos or this is a possibility i've heard a theory as to why a lot of people are being unsubscribed from channels by the system because they are not, in fact, they are actually not clicking the bell. So YouTube thinks, oh, this is an old account it's, or, you know, a bot or something. So they just chuck it out the, uh, they chuck it out the channel. They get rid of it. They minus it. And uh, I've had that before. A lot of minusing and subscribers and things. So a uh, bit of an issue that. So please do interact. And uh, yeah, other than that, I'll leave you guys to it. Whatever you're up to. Some of you might be going to sleep, some of you might be revising on a work night, sh night shift, eating, uh, I don't know, working out, something like that, meditating. But yeah, I hope you're all well, and uh, I'll catch you tomorrow.